All right, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining our Thursday weekly webinar. I'm Justin Paperni with White Collar Advice. We know you're all busy, so we're grateful that you're here. And today we're gonna cover things we've covered previously, that when we do these live webinars, we're always inserting new things that we're learning with hopes that it helps all of you. As a reminder, this is being recorded. If you miss it or you find such value in it, you need to watch it again. Uh -oh. It only took 30 seconds, but I'm already going to muting everyone. This could be a record. As a reminder, as we start, if you could mute yourself, that would be terrific um, so we don't have to hear you. Uh, but of course, when you want to speak, unmute yourself. Let me go to the mute button. One second. All right. One second. I'm struggling to find it actually, which is very unlike me considering. Oh, there it is. We do. Okay. So if you want to watch the recording of this, you should. I know there are some spouses on the webinar who are watching this and they're going to be sharing these insights with their loved one when, when you visit. So thank you. Everyone wants to have a very good outcome through sentencing and, and prison. And to do that, it's easier if you have fewer problems. And as I wrote earlier, the lion's share of people who become immersed in the criminal justice system would tell you in a million years, they never thought they would become immersed in the system, yet here we are. And that tends to be the same people who say, I will never get a disciplinary infraction, yet they happen. Because as I was writing a reminder email about 45 minutes ago, I received a message from a spouse whose husband was written up for a disciplinary infraction in Morgantown. And then it's for, it's fear. Oh my goodness, will this cost him the year off they gave him for the drug program? Well, Can't hear you, Justin. It froze. Forgive me. There's a little issue with. It's been very windy. Forgive me, everyone. It's been very windy where I live, and apparently AT and T struggles with wind because they've been knocking out my Wi-Fi. So just bear with me as we go through this. Okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. It's, it's AT and T. Thank you. So. We wanna make sure that moving forward, you fully understand this process. If you have questions along the way, please add them to chat. Scott and others on our team, Kent and Scott will respond to them. And of course, put your hand up if you have specific questions. Like we do on every webinar, our team really stresses the importance of spending time every single day at prisonprofessors.com going through our free resources. Michael is producing content every day and the lion's share of questions we've received as it relates to the First Step Act, earn time credits. He is addressing real time every single day and sharing with our community. And we want you to have access to that information as well. So much like you might watch a TV show for a few minutes, I highly encourage you to spend five or 10 minutes every day with professors. Okay, thank you. Now, before we get going, are there any questions that anyone has about preparing for prison? Because absolutely, we're going to cover them. Does anything jump out at you as you're getting ready to surrender? Is anything popping up right now before I transition into some surrender tips we want all of you to convey? Is anything, anything, any questions or anything? Okay. If not, we're going to jump into... The PowerPoint. One moment. You can ask the questions. Yeah, you can absolutely ask the questions. And then we're going to ask them. As you're getting ready to surrender to prison, there's a number of things that you should do. And one of the key points that we have learned from subject matter experts we're interviewing is really the value in documenting the journey. And writing for the value of stake. Earlier this week, I met with someone who is going to be going to prison, who is a CEO in Northern California, has run very large businesses. And he was very honest when he said, do I really need to document the journey? Do I really need a release plan? With all due respect, I've had a lot of success. I'm just going to prison 
I think it's going to be for 13 or 14 months for a tax crime. Do I really need to do that? And my initial response is this guy's successful. He doesn't necessarily need a release plan for his family or his children. He doesn't have to work again. But his goal, like all of you, is to get out, to have a productive journey, to get out, to influence case management. And the way that you do that is by documenting the journey, not by telling them what you're going to do, but by documenting it. So I encourage all of you, before your surrender to prison, you begin to document what it is you plan to do while you were there. Scott Laney is on our team. Scott, can you talk just for a moment? I want to make this collaborative. I want to engage people. Scott, can you talk for a moment about the value you found in documenting your journey both before prison and while you were in prison? Yes, Justin, thanks for asking. I, I documented the journey extensively. Um, for me, on a personal level, it helped really refine my thinking and it helped kind of alter the experience for me. <laughs> Um, is, is far on the freedom level, I think that it had a really positive influence over a lot of people who had discretion over my liberty. Um, some of them mentioned it, some of them I think were aware of it and moved by it, but did not give me that, that feedback. But just showing where you were, what you've done, what you've achieved, and, and how I used my time wisely um, really played a big role in me having a more successful journey through the system and an easier transition onto probation. We're going to put a link to this URL in the chat. Many people struggle with what they would call writer's block, like where do I start? What do I write? A good way to get away, get around writer's block is to simply to start with asking or really answering these questions. I'd like to take a picture of that. Asking and answering these questions. Okay. I'm muting everyone, but it get it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Please give a thumbs up if you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you for your patience with some of these technical difficulties. This is very unlike me. Scott, thank you for sharing that. So I'd encourage all of you, if you struggle with what to write, knowing that within a month of your surrender to prison, you're going to meet with a case manager who may be vested or may just give you three or four minutes and who might be used to hearing you say things like, I just want to get out of prison, send me home. You have to approach this differently. So I think a good task for all of you is to take these questions and answer them. In what ways are you defining the best possible outcome? How do you intend to document that journey? What priorities must you put in place before the start of the journey? How will you show you've executed the plan? Case managers and other Bureau of Prisons professionals with whom we have spoken feel they are told only what they want to hear and there isn't any follow through. Sentencing judges with whom we have spoke have told us, I feel some defendants tell me only what I want to hear and there is very little follow through. It's part of the reason some judges like Judge Carter say to a defendant, I want you to come back and see me when you're on probation. And I'm curious to see if you follow through on all the commitments that you, say, you said to me today. And if you have, I might consider letting you off probation early. Deal, the defendant always says, deal. Good, I look forward to seeing you when you're home from prison. So you need to put yourself in the shoes of all of the stakeholders. You might be thinking you don't need a release plan. I understand that. But if the goal is higher levels of liberty, a shorter sentence, because you should be doing this if you have yet to be sentenced. But on the post-sentencing side, it's something you're going to want to share with your case manager. Because as we've articulated through all of the subject matter experts that we hire, including Chris Maloney, the former head of federal probation, he said a federal probation officer, your probation officer, is trained to look at what? Your probation report. Well, you may meet your probation officer years and years later. How much has changed since that probation report? If you don't document and show that growth, you're weakened. And what are they going to do? They're only going to judge you by the government's version of events, the plea agreement, the crime that you committed. And it is sad at times when someone's home from prison, they reach out and they tell us all the incredible things they did, and there is no documentation of it. It requires work to write because it's a very active 
strategy, unlike reading, which can be passive, especially if you don't retain the knowledge. So our team encourages you. We're going to post this link in the chat. A good exercise between now and next week or before you surrender, start your release plan by answering these 10 questions. It's a pretty good way to get started. Second thing we encourage everyone to do is establishing a primary point of contact. And Michael wrote, before surrendering to prison, a person should appoint a primary point of contact. The, the contact may be a spouse, a parent, a best friend, a lawyer. The person should help the point of contact understand what to expect if things don't go right. The point of contact must have a plan in place. So for example, someone recently in our community was remanded immediately at their sentencing hearing. Because they had a point of contact in place, the family, what they weren't freaked out. They weren't scared. They immediately knew how to get money onto his books, how to mail him information, what visitation would look like. They already had a power of attorney set up before sentencing. And also because the defendant knew the US attorney was going to ask that he was remanded, he did all of his prison preparations in advance of his sentencing. So if you have yet to be sentenced and there's a chance, like some judges like Judge Dimitriolis in Florida have a policy of remanding everyone. If there's a judge that, if there's a chance you're going to be remanded, you got to do the prison prep before you go in and you need to have a primary point of contact in place so your family can advocate for you. When I was in prison, I didn't do that. I needed to get a power of attorney to deal with some financial orders. And frankly, it took weeks and months to get organized. And it was just a very big inconvenience, not just for me and my family. You have more leverage before you go in. Please create that point or that power of contact in advance of your surrender, okay? We've done these webinars previously, but I'm gonna go through these kind of top 10 more quickly today. And then we're gonna transition into disciplinary infractions. Number three, understand financial implications. Someone called me four days ago to tell me the judge did him a courtesy by stating he doesn't have to pay restitution while he's in prison. And he was adamant that he was not going to pay restitution in prison. Our team encourages you, <laughs> even if it's voluntary, to make financial payments while in prison by way of the financial responsibility program. If you have a fine that has not been paid, forfeiture, restitution, our team encourages you to make payments while in prison. Some mistakes that people make if they owe money, they'll surrender with too much money. They'll surrender if they're going in for a year, they'll surrender with six grand. If you owe money, the, the government or your case manager might take all of it for your victims and, and restitution. So our team encourages you three, four, five hundred dollars the first month if you owe money. I'll put up a link here on how to send money to prison, mail policies, email. We give all of this away by way of the nonprofit prison professors. But it's essential that if you're asked to pay financial restitution in prison, you should pay it. I would not say I'm not required to. You may win, but they may put you in front of a, your, your bunk might be in front of the toilet, or you might not get your desired job, or things could go bad for you. So I'm encouraging you, if asked, especially if you've pled guilty and accepted responsibility, and you've told the judge you're going to make amends and pay your victims back, the next step is to actually create a plan to pay them back. And you should be building that out in your reentry plan as well. Because one of the first things your probation officer will ask you is, what's your plans to pay people back? Oh, you want to go be an entrepreneur and start a new business. You haven't documented it. How am I going to allow you to do that when you owe money? Go get a $20 an hour job. Sorry, it ain't going to happen. If you're not thinking now about the financial implications when you're done with prison, you're not prepared for prison. And if you're not giving thought to it now, you're not prepared for prison. Further, even those that don't owe money can still have restrictions placed on them by their probation officer if they have not shown why they're worthy of the employment opportunity they want. Scott is on our team, it wasn't by accident. He documented the journey through prison. People frequently told me in prison, you'll never be able to work with Michael, a felon who served 26 years, you're wasting your time. Yet when I was released from prison because of my reentry plan, it was approved. I was approved to work with Michael who served 26 years in prison, day one, not by accident. It was engineered from the time that I met him and it paid off many years into the future. Engineer that plan with our team or with our free resources. This is more than whether you should buy an avocado or apple in the commissary. I get those text messages. I don't care. I don't care if you buy Pepsi or Coke. I'm going to be honest with you. We want you to succeed. We want you to crush it. I'm sorry if some of the fruit is spoiled. I'm sorry if you want a nine and a half shoe and they give you a 10. Who cares? We want you making decisions that prepare you for prison and to have the most productive experience possible, which is why you need to understand the financial implications. Further, Many of you, if not already, are getting fired by your banks. It's going to continue. More to come. We encourage all of you right now to maintain and frankly create new banking relationships. Be proactive. 
some people have said, hey, uh, I've pled guilty a year, a year ago. It hasn't happened yet. And then unfortunately, uh, four days later, I get a text message. I can't believe Wells Fargo fired me. I've been with them for 37 years. Succeeding through this really wretched system requires being proactive and making choices today that will pay off years into the future. You may document your work today and write in and think nobody cares. Nobody's going to read it. I gave it to my case manager. I think she threw it in the trash. That sucks. It's part of your record. Keep doing it. You document it. You have a primary point of contact. When you surrender, you'll be asked, who do we call in case something happens? Things of that nature. Those are things we want to prepare for now. I'm begging you, financial, pay the restitution and establish banking relationships. Now, every now and again, someone will ask me if I have relationships. I try. I always reach out, ask people with whom I know if they're willing to take on a new account. So if you've been fired from your bank, reach out to me. All I can do is send a referral. They do a little check. I disclose the conviction. I disclose how long ago the conviction was. Money laundering tends to be the worst. But reach out to me. I have some relationships. In the interim, I have found local banks better than the, the big wirehouses. But you should be establishing relationships. I'm no longer a banker, but they'll fire wives, even though they're not part of the case. For that reason, some clients have a, their wife has a totally separate bank than where they bank. I want you to be proactive and recognize um, you may get fired. And it sucks to deal with that from prison, especially if you have a retirement account and they can liquidate it and trigger a taxable event. We need to prepare for these things uh, right now. We've spent some time in the past talking about budgets in prison. I know this is an extensive experience with lawyers and lost earnings and everything that accompanies this. So you should give thought now to how much you'll spend in prison. We know very wealthy people who spend $150 a month, and we know some people who have limited resources who find a way to spend $1,000 a month, no joke. We would encourage you, you can really live well on $300 or $400 a month. You can spend $360 a month in the commissary. You can five cents a minute for email via the core links. Scott, tell me with COVID, were they charging for phone minutes? What was that process <clears throat> right now with phone? So there is, at least when I was there, and I, I believe this is currently the case, there is no charge for phone minutes. And they also upped the limit to 500 minutes per month. So to 15 minute limit per phone call. Um, we're all pretty lucky. We can we can call home at least one time every day of the month and still not be through all our minutes. And there is no additional cost. So that's changed. When I was in prison, it was 300 minutes and now it's 500 and they're not charging for it. People frequently ask us, should you do like a Google phone number or a calling service? I've never done that. You have to do your own due diligence and decide if you want to do that. I just called home and, and, and endured the cost of it, whatever it was. But you have 500 phone minutes a month. When called, it will leave us a private caller block, or sometimes it comes up with a 202 number from Washington, D.C. You should let your family know when you're going to call that it's going to be blocked. Of course, the phone call is recorded. Part of the reasons in this, I'm going to touch on this in disciplinary infractions in about 12 or 14 minutes. Part of the reason some people get into trouble is they do what I did which is talk too loudly on the phone. I didn't get a disciplinary infraction, but I tended to speak too loudly on the phone, especially when you're calling iPhones like I was in Los Angeles, heavy traffic. And a prisoner looking to cooperate as an informant could hear something and run to staff and say, you know, Justin Paperni just said something on the phone and the case manager, they can go back and listen to the call. Thankfully, I never said anything wrong, but that's how people at times get into trouble. It's not like they're sitting on their walkie-talkie in a golf cart just listening to you. Sometimes they can. They're really going to go back and they can listen to it. And oftentimes, it's a prisoner reporting you to staff, which comes down to understanding your environment, being quiet, avoiding problems, things that we're going to touch on here in a little bit. Scott, I think the phone shuts off after 15 minutes, right? That is correct. Yeah, it sucks when you're in the middle of a conversation and then it just goes dark on you. <laughs> okay. It's not so, fun. Plenty of good memories of that. Yeah, sure. Some people do step literally, uh, some prisoners, when they call, they'll hit their stopwatch. Uh, I remember Michael doing that because phone minutes are so precious. So if it goes into another minute, you don't lose it. But those are decisions you're going to have to make. I was, uh, I didn't do that. So three to $500 a month, you can live like a king in federal prison. When I mentioned that some people spend eight or $900, there can be a handful of reasons why. People like Michael, Michael is a prolific writer in prison. He would write a book via core links, no joke. So he at five cents a minute, it would get pretty expensive if you're writing a book. So if you're on email all day at five cents a minute, the tab's going to get pretty high. Some prisoners maximize their budget 
because they want to roll the dice and engage in the hustle. So for example, if you have too much money come on your books, the prison can take a lot of that money to pay restitution. So to get around it, they'll find a prisoner and say, hi, can I have money go to your books? You shop on my behalf. Therefore, the prison doesn't see the deposit and they can shop. And you can do that among several prisoners. It's why some guys can spend $1,000 a month in prison, all while not even really paying much on their restitution, because technically they show $100 or $200 a month coming in. It's rolling the dice. It's risky. Some people do it. Some, some don't get caught. I'd encourage you to go down a different path uh, that you have to you have to make your own own decisions, your own choices. Continuing on, creating a deliberate reading list. This is a really wonderful way to connect with your family prior to your surrender. I would encourage you, like right now, when you get off this call, I think it's a good idea to begin answering those questions I posted earlier. I think it's a good idea to form a reading list, and then also in your release plan you're going to write about, you're going to share your reading list. You're going to share with your probation officer. We had someone in our community share with their case manager and the case manager's like, I'm going to read this book. This is, I don't even know if I need the book. You did the book report for me. This is really fascinating. And I want to say it was Elon Musk's book, but I could be wrong. I think it was Elon Musk's book that was written uh, many years ago by the, uh, uh, it was a great book. I read it myself. The point is before you go in, create a very deliberate reading list. And then I'd encourage you to share it with your network before you go in. Someone like Scott put it on his website it's for everyone to read. But it's a great way to build your reentry plan and to learn. And many of you need to rebuild and start a new career. You need to start anew as, as I did. I put up a YouTube video yesterday how I wasted months into my federal prison sentence doing nothing but exercise. And then it hit me. I'm going home. I have not engineered any pathway to help people or myself or pay back the $535,000 in restitution that I owed that I finally paid off in 2018. It all started because of choices I made while I was in prison. And it's starting with reading good literature. So I'd encourage you to build into your release plan. How many books are you going to read? What's the purpose of reading these books? What steps will you take to record what you've read? And that leads to something that we encourage you to build into your release plan. Why did you read the book? What did you learn from the book? And how will the book help you? How will the book contribute to success upon your release from prison? This is harder than just reading. It requires writing and activity. This is why a release plan can go from 10 pages to a thousand pages. And it's something that you can publish on the internet with your family, with whomever. It's a dynamic document that grows. But what you cannot do is just sit around all day and read and feel as if you're productive because if quizzed, about what you've just read. If you can't recite it, then it's just like watching a movie. And that's what too many prisoners do. They read, they can't remember it, and they cannot articulate how it will help them. So in advance of your surrender, I'd encourage you to create a reading list. And something that I did with my mom that brought us closer together, we would each read the book and simultaneously discuss it in visitation. If you have children, you can do that. Share the book report via your release plan, send it home via email or put it on your website share it with your probation officer from prison. There are people that will tell you a release plan is useless, it's worthless, that your case manager is going to throw it in the trash. If you believe that, that's your choice. Those are the same people that told Michael when he went to the penitentiary that you will never leave the penitentiary. You will serve your whole sentence in the penitentiary, yet through his release plan and record, he served the last 10 years in a camp. There's evidence of success, evidence of people who have done it. You need to use your own judgment and determine if it's a good idea to write a book report, because I'll be transparent. Some people have said to me, you gotta be kidding. What am I in the third grade writing a book report about James and the Giant Peach? Yes, if that's the book you wanna read and if that book's gonna help you when you come home, read it, great book, I loved it. Use your own judgment, thank you. We, are, we also put up a list here of books that, um, this is a book list from Michael. Uh, ironically, or I should say strategically, his book is first, but it's a good book. And by the way, if anyone would like a free copy of Earning Freedom, we're happy to send you the audiobook. We're happy to send it to you. Put a note in chat. We will send you the audiobook from Audible at our expense. I think every time we send it, it's eight or ten dollars. We'll send it to you. We'll cover the cost. You just need to read it. Another book that's very inspirational is Sean Hopwood's book, Jailhouse Lawyer. Sean served 12 years in prison for robbing banks, and he's now a professor at Georgetown Law School. And yes, the first step act that passed in 18 was in large part thanks to Sean. So important that when President Trump did the signing, he called Sean up to thank him and President Trump gave Sean the pen that he signed to enact this legislation. Sean served 12 years for robbing banks. Look at the release plan that he created. I'd read his book too. So I want all of you to create your book list 
right now and share it with your family. Get excited and document it. Step five, creating a journaling and writing plan. We really just kind of covered that as well. Of course, people who are in our post-sentencing program, we mail all of these resources to you while you're in prison. We also email it to you and we're checking in with you throughout the way. But whether it's free resources that you're working with, we encourage you to really create a realistic journaling plan. And something that Scott could attest to, if you're not reading good literature and being productive in prison, if you're documenting the journey and you're not showing growth, after about a week, people are going to say, uh, thank you. I'm tired of reading what time you got up and what you had for breakfast. Have a nice day. I'll see you when you come home. So Scott, talk about for a moment when you say you're going to document the journey by way of a release plan, how you really have to work your ass off because you want to share relevant content with people. Talk about that for a sec. It, it is important that it's relevant. For me, um, I struggled at first figuring out what I would write. And then like you advised everyone too early on, I just began writing. And then I noticed myself <clears throat> throughout the experience of incarceration, thinking, well, what would I want to achieve today? What what could help me? What could influence a stakeholder one year, two years, three years down the line? So it was, it was about how I wanted to perceive the experience, how I wanted to change my thinking. And two things that go over really well in the Bureau of Prisons and in life is humility and patience. So anything you can write, anything you can learn, any, any additional ways to live by those virtues proved for me and I think would prove for anyone to be exceptionally helpful. One thing I'll say is don't commit to writing if you're not going to do it. And don't commit to building a release plan and sharing it with your network if you're not going to fill it with relevant, meaningful stuff, because then you're going to look well, then you're, you could look how the government expects us to look. They look at us as criminals, not as husbands and fathers and community leaders. They look at us as criminals. And they expect us to say to them what they want to hear, and they don't expect follow through. So if you're going to tell a judge something, and you're going to go back to that judge to get off probation early, or you're going to try to earn, or you, you, you think you're worthy of a compassionate release by way of the First Step Act, whatever it may be, if you're not demonstrating why you're worthy of it and how you've changed and grown, it's what the government would say is happy talk. There's no follow through. So sometimes the best release plan is no release plan. If you're not actually going to do any substantive work that shows how you're growing and developing over time. I want to be very, very clear about that. As we go to personal belongings, um, look, the BOP is not all of the rules apply. Believe it or not, we had someone in our community surrender to the low at Lompoc. And the guard let him get in with the Timex watch that he purchased. From, that he purchased, it was the same watch from the commissary and a pair of all white shoes. In a low security prison, when we spoke with the, this person, we said, "Hey, if you want to spend a hundred dollars at Big Five to get shoes and a watch, there's a one percent chance they're going to let you in. Give it a shot." The guard was having a good day. Said, "I'm going to let you bring it in." That was in a low security prison, but I've heard those stories at Lewisburg, at Morgantown, Lompoc. Uh, I just mentioned Terminal Island. It happened one time at Taft, which is now closed where I serve time. The point is, as you prepare your belongings, you want to bring things you absolutely need. Uh, so for your ID, you can bring your, your passport. If you're vaccinated, you can bring that vaccination card with you. Uh, some people will walk into the institution with someone. Some people regret that. Kind of depends on the length of the sentence and how emotionally you're holding up. Some people surrender to the prison on their own. You can absolutely bring medications with you. You should. In advance of your surrender, I would spend some time at the BOP formulary list to get an idea of what the BOP may transition you to. Of course, people who work in our post-sentencing program spend time with Carol Santos, who knows this BOP may as well, plus she's a registered nurse. So it's important that you understand medical needs and what you can bring before your surrender, because it's a transition to go to prison, and it's an even greater transition if you're used to medications that you are not getting. So we want you to prepare your reentry plan, prepare your contact list, Get your budget in order. Make sure your family knows how to send you money by way of Western Union or send it to the Dropbox in Iowa. Medications, if you have a pending legal case, you can surrender with, with these documentation. We had someone who surrendered on a Tuesday to Pensacola. He visited that Saturday. He was prepared. He was ready. His family was listed in the probation report. Therefore, they didn't have to get approved to visit. Surrendered on a Tuesday, visited with his family Saturday and Sunday in Pensacola all by way of preparation. Scott, is there anything else? I, I would not encourage you to bring money uh, to prison. Sometimes they'll let it in. Uh, but Scott, what, what did you bring quickly when you surrendered uh, when you surrendered to Yankee Federal Prison Camp? You know, I didn't have any issues bringing in a pair of glasses. They were accepting of that. Although 
Uh, if you if you forget your glasses or if your glasses break, they were they were good enough regarding eye care. Um, contact lenses, however, are not allowed. Um, that that seemed to come up with us a lot, and and they don't make very many exceptions for that. I think we mentioned religious medallions. Did we yes. cover that? That's allowed. Um, and again, like you mentioned, the gentleman at, at Lompoc Low. You can try, and anything that was denied, they simply just sent back home with me. I brought in a pair of sunglasses, and they did not allow that. The sun. Thank you, Scott. What do you use? The sunglasses. That's all. I tried. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> so don't forget, this is the. They want you to buy as much as you possibly can in the commissary. Also, it doesn't. They kind of do it under the guise of security of the institution. Okay. So a good exercise before you go in. You can absolutely go to the commissary list, see what you can buy, what you're able to purchase there. Uh, when I got out of jail, I used to give it a prison. I used to give that advice on what to buy. I don't do it any longer. It's very subjective. I guess if I had one piece of advice, I'd say I know I didn't buy a watch till I was in for a few months. I prioritized the Walkman. Now you can buy an MP3 player. It's expensive, but you'll see the 360 goes pretty quickly. And some prisons only allow you to spend, I think it's 180 every couple of weeks. And there are going to be prisoners that help you get adjusted and give you some things with very good intentions. You have to discern if you want to take it or not. But I want you to pay attention to that. We just discussed the number seven, uh, understanding medical preparations. I'll put up all of these links and we send out the web, web, I can't speak, the webinar replay. We will include all of these links for you. Mail, email, money, top 10 list, disciplinary infractions, Bureau of Prisons National Formulary. We're going to give all of this to you because we want you to be prepared. And we're so grateful that you're part of our community. We want to help you. We want to prepare you. We're going to send all of this to you. Just give us two days following this webinar to get all of the links together. But the BOP formulary is a good idea for you to go through. I'm not a physician. You should speak with your physician. And of course, Carol can offer some insights on medications and whatnot. We also, as you know, did an interview with Hugh Hurwitz, the former director of the Bureau of Prisons where he offered insights on medical care treatment in prison. We'll also send you that link. And Michael actually was on the road this week in um, Missouri, I believe, with Hugh Hurwitz while they were speaking in federal prison. So we really encourage you to, to watch that interview with Hugh. Number eight, develop a personal communication and success plan. Kind of the same thing that we're, we've been discussing by way of the reentry plan. One thing that Michael did well that he encouraged me to do that many people in our community do it, some don't, it's interesting. We have people in our community, even who work with us in the post-sentencing program, who will email us from prison and say, someone told me it's a waste of time to send the letter to my probation officer, so I'm not going to do it. So, so despite all the evidence from subject matter experts that we interview, including the head of, head of federal probation, despite the evidence that I have shared how it benefited me and how it benefited Michael, and you can read the letters he was sending and what he was doing in the release plan workbook that we give you at no cost, some was, someone was influenced by a new prisoner who said it would be a waste of time, and he chose to agree. And my response is, our team would do it differently. That's what we've learned from experts. But I defer to your judgment and what you think is best for you and your family. And if you're unwilling to spend 15 minutes to send a letter to a probation officer that could help you get higher levels of liberty upon your release, that's your choice. We would do it differently. We'll always be here to help you. We'll always be here to help all of you. Use your own judgment. Think for yourself. Learn from what subject matter experts tell us throughout the whole journey like getting your narrative to the probation officer, pretty big deal. Getting the narrative of the sentencing judge, case manager, and so on. And we have all the interviews uh, for you to watch. As we transition now into disciplinary infractions, <clears throat> and this really ties into creating your quadrant guide for decision-making. It's a very important subject. And Michael used to teach some really cool classes about this in prison. People make decisions in these quadrants that can <clears throat> like a high risk, potentially high reward behavior. And I'll actually, I'm gonna open it up to some questions here in a moment. And I see many of them coming in. Can someone give me their insights on what they think a high risk, high reward behavior would be in federal prison? Can someone engage me for a moment? When you hear that, so you have low risk, low reward. That's probably watching TV all day. Now, some people would say it's there's risk in the TV room, but low risk, low reward, you're in the TV room all day. I would argue a, High reward, low risk is writing and developing your release plan. Probably a good idea. Can I, someone in, indulge me? What do you view as a high reward, high risk activity? Anyone? Um, I would say it, it's it's Linda. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. 
No, Linda, uh, go ahead. I, I, I found it very helpful to, to write down what was going on in my surroundings as much as what was going on with me. Um, and I spent a lot of time documenting it. And if I found something that I thought was helpful, I actually found it good for me to be able to, to convey that. And, and I did on, on a pretty regular basis. Um, there were just little, little things that, that I found, you know, we could pass on to, to the next person coming up down the line. And, uh, I found that was very helpful Scott, to me personally, you yeah, know, I, yeah. Scott, were you, was someone going to add something? Right. Ray, Ray, anyone, Scott? I said was, that. Go ahead. Who is, who is that? Lawrence. Lawrence, go ahead. So I think that uh, using someone else's cell phone is an example of a high reward, high risk activity. Um, you know, you want to communicate to your family. You don't think you'd be found out. But if you do, it is found out. It's going to be a huge ding on you. Could possibly increase your sentence. So we're going to transition to, thank you, you're right. A high risk, high reward activity happened with someone recently. They ran out of phone minutes and they're going through some very difficult circumstances at home. Another uh, one is to write a book. We can talk about that in a moment, high risk, high reward. We'll talk about that. I used to have that conversation with Michael in prison. The high risk, high reward, this prisoner ran out of phone minutes and some real issues at home and he felt like he needed to FaceTime his children to save something that was transpiring. And there are prisoners who will have, you're going to see so many of these iPhones in prison, it's scary. And someone, he FaceTimed with his family, high reward, he felt like he had really dissolved a problem at home. But of course, he was caught. And devastating consequences of getting caught. And how do they catch you? When you surrender to prison, you get all of your phone numbers approved, of course. Some people will have phone numbers go to other people's whatever. But they got the iPhone and they cross check it against every number that had been called. And it takes about three seconds to find out this person had called someone. In another case, someone lost access to email due to a disciplinary infraction. They couldn't email. So they were using an iPhone that they bought to manage and deal with business at home because they lost email access. And it was a, a rationalization. They took email away from me. I had to some of the criminal thinking that led that person into prison. We want you to be aware of high risk, high reward behaviors, high reward, being able to call home and solve a problem, high risk as well, because he went to the hole. And as we transition into things that have kind of changed within the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and of course, we're going to share this with you, the inmate discipline program. And there's four series of shots with the Bureau of Prisons, series 100, 200, 300, and 400. Now, this document is pretty old. But something that is not even in this document that is now a series 100 transaction is an iPhone. So when people think of a series 100 shot, it's murder, rape, tattooing, escaping. Yeah, you would think I would never do that. A 100 disciplinary infraction that could lead to a new charge, that's insane. But if you're vulnerable and can be exploited or taken advantage of and somebody says, hey, hey dude, for five bucks, you can call home and fix that problem with your wife. Here's the phone. It's no big deal. Walk around the track. They'll never know. Are you vulnerable? If caught, that's a series 100 disciplinary infraction. And some people, according to the Department of Justice, and I can share with you the press releases, are getting indicted for new charges with up to a full year in prison for using an iPhone, especially if they deem that you're running a business. So I want you to understand the consequences of using an iPhone. And I mentioned earlier that I received a call from someone at Morgantown, and that's what happened. Her husband got caught using an iPhone. Scott, as I go to these disciplinary infractions, did, did you see some of those on the inside? Was it pervasive at, at Yankton or you've been home for a little while? Was the iPhone issue not such a big deal? What was that? What was your experience at Yankton and the camp? <clears throat> it was not as big a deal at Yankton as it is at some other camps. Um, from what inmates there told me, the reason being Yankton was a, a standalone prison camp and there was a lot of staff and they were around quite frequently. Um, versus if you're at a satellite prison camp and most of the staff is focusing on the higher security institution. I also participated in RDAP and at a lot of facilities, when you're in RDAP, you were in your own wing or your own unit. And as if the consequences for using a cell phone aren't enough as is, when you're in RDAP, if you get caught with a cell phone, that is game over, transferred to a low, kicked out of the program, your year is taken away. Um, it was just really hard 
to to justify that. So they existed, um, but they were fewer than at the average prison. However, I steered far, far away from them. So when we send you this document, you're going to see series 100 shots, killing, rioting, encouraging others to riot, taking hostages. That's right out of a movie. But you can actually add using an iPhone as a 100 series shot that is significant, believe it or not, is these sorts of things. As you work your way down the list, you'll see the consequences, of course, of a disciplinary infraction can include time and segregation up to a year. That's where you're living in a box for 23 hours a day, like people endure during COVID when they were quarantining showering, I think three days a week, 15 minutes out. Okay, very tough. Loss of job, housing assignment. The worst consequence besides a, a, char, a, a transfer in time in the hole is you can lose your good time credit. And that's what they write here. Forfeit and withhold, earn statutory good time up to 100% or terminate, disallow extra good time. We need you to think about this. 200 series level infractions, our team has received some of those, for example, showing up late to work, being in an unauthorized area. For example, one time someone went into a counselor's office without permission, went in there to wait. That's in an unauthorized area. He's a male, she's a female, she was uncomfortable with it, she wrote him up. Level 200 infraction, showing up late for work, being disrespectful to staff. The count is going on. They, the guard needs to do it three or four times because they didn't get the count right. And you say something that frustrates them. Like, can't you people even count? That's a disciplinary infraction. Stay there. Be quiet. It will eventually end. Do not make matters. Do not make matters worse. Things of that nature. Even something like this. Clothing. Possessing. Uh, it's not clothing. Uh, there are people there. There you can buy a pair of pants. You get a pair of pants. They may cut them down to a pair of shorts. And just like that. You can get into trouble for those things. We've seen it. Some would call it petty, but the reality is these things happen. Level one and two disciplinary infractions, you cannot deal with informally and resolve from your record. They're, they're significant. A three or four, a series three or 400 level infraction, 400, for example, is run, getting caught running a business from prison because you don't understand policy, nor do you know how to do it. But I can tell you done with policy, with staff acknowledging, I built began to build white collar advice from prison. Michael, a prolific writer from prison, got publishing deals from prison with staff aware of his work. That's running and growing a business, but we understood policy. Many people do not. So if you don't and you run a business, it's a level 400 shot, refusing to go to work or an assignment, speaking disrespectfully to a staff member. I can tell you a level three or 400 series disciplinary infraction, you can deal with informally where you can accept responsibility. That happened recently with someone in our community. They showed up, showed up twice in a week late to work. They were gonna write him up. He responded properly. Actually, he responded based on something that Michael wrote in our, wrote in our blog that essentially said, I accept responsibility. I did it. It won't happen again. I made a mistake. I've been going through a difficult adjustment. Uh, I can assure you I'll never show up late again. And the GAR correctional officer gave him additional work detail. He responded to the disciplinary infraction perfectly rather than, hey, these other guys are late. Did you know the three guys don't even do their job, but yet I show up two minutes late and you're giving me a tough time? That's what he could have said, because it's true. A lot of dudes don't show up to do their job and some staff members don't care, but they might care about you. Only focus on yourself. Don't worry about other people. So we will share this with you. Gambling, of course. I mean, gambling is pervasive inside of these low and, and minimum security camps. Staff knows, some care, some do not. But there's a lot of times people owe gambling debts, and that's why money is going to other people's books. I think the one fight I saw in prison related to gambling, someone who claimed to have a lot of money, like so many people in prison claim to have a lot of money because they like to show off why I have no idea. But this person who claimed to have a lot of money, who ironically couldn't afford to buy shoes in the commissary, struggled to pay his gambling debt. And it really led to some problems. And it was resolved, I think, when his wife gave thousands of dollars to cash to another prisoner's wife in the parking lot following visitation. Probably not a great way to prove worthy of the love and support of your spouse who's working two jobs if you ask her to cover your gambling debts, though these things happen. We just want you to be aware of them. And you may be thinking, Justin, I'm not dumb. I would never do this. But what if you associate with someone that does? That's why we want you to be careful in the friendships that you form and let them happen organically. You're, it's going to happen, but don't feel compelled to be, form a friendship with someone or walk the track. What's the upside? You've been in prison for a few minutes. You don't know them and they don't know you. Bide your time, please.
Now, I want to talk about who can initiate or how do disciplinary infractions get initiated? This is how. Staff might witness you doing something incorrectly or something wrong. Happens a lot. But also another prisoner turns you in and they run to staff and there are benefits that can follow. So understanding how disciplinary infractions initiates is important. Someone had mentioned the book. It could be high risk, high reward. I, I would agree with that. It was very high reward working on a book with Michael in prison, but it upset some people. There's no doubt it upset people that I was serving a measly year in a minimum security camp. And Michael, who had been in for 22 years, was mentoring and guiding me. Some guys were angry. They asked him, why are you doing that? You've been in the, you've been in the pen. Why are you helping this guy? Well, they, some didn't like me because of that and that I was going home soon. So there were some people that, you know, kind of said some things to my case manager that I'm doing this. And that was that brought some attention to me. Thankfully, my sentence was so short, it didn't matter. I was on my way out as quickly as I went in. But you're right. It could be perceived as a high risk, high reward behavior if you're writing a book or a blog. So that's why the content that you create matters. In my case, my content was productive and positive, and I thank staff for helping me. So when they read it, it advanced my agenda. Nothing in there hurt me. I did share a story one time. I wrote one thing that came back to bite me. Literally one thing we wrote in lessons from prison created problems after I left. And I regret that. And the guy said, if I was still in prison, he'd have hurt me. So you do want to understand how everything you write and say will influence your time in prison. And even after you leave prison, because there could be consequences for your friends. Thankfully, Michael had endured everything in prison. So he was able to dissolve it pretty easily. But yeah, that could be a high risk, high reward behavior. Something that you should understand, everyone who works in the prison has the authority to write a disciplinary infraction. So while you would never use an iPhone in front of a warden or case manager, you should understand that the, the guy walking around the compound, I like to say with holy jeans and 80 keys on there, if he hears something wrong, he has the ability to write a disciplinary infraction. Years ago at the camp in Schuylkill, a very small camp in Pennsylvania, a couple of prisoners were thought they had formed kind of a friendship with the chaplain who was an employee of the prison. And they were in the, chap the chapel all day, which was great. But apparently one had said something that the chaplain thought was not right. And just like that, it goes from kind of a friendship working together and then the chaplain every day to him uh, writing them up for a disciplinary infraction. It was very uncomfortable and they let their guard down. They let their guard down in front of the chaplain in a way they would never let their way down, guard down in front of a case manager or warden. We never want you to forget that. Some people, when they go to prison, they're very on guard for a while. And then in time, they feel like they kind of understand this environment. And that's when they seek to exploit it. You probably wouldn't engage in the prison hustle in your first three or four notes, three or four, excuse me, three or four months. But after you've been there for a while, you kind of think you've mastered this environment. And that's when trouble starts to happen. So we'd encourage you to never let your guard down and to understand uh, they're always watching. And a disciplinary infraction would derail your record because the first thing they look at in a team meeting, do you have any infractions? Do you have any infractions? We would encourage you if you get written up for a, an infraction, if you did it, you own it, that's the best possible scenario to emerge unscathed or to have it not really impact your record. Some like to fight, 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 even though I hate to say it's kind of a formality that you're going to lose. I'm not saying if you didn't did it, if you didn't do it and you were written up, you shouldn't fight, but it is kind of like a kangaroo court-like process. It's really difficult to prevail on a disciplinary infraction and the consequences are very significant. And even if you don't get written up for an, an infraction, they are looking for inconsistencies. There are people who are going through the drug program who will tell the drug coordinator, this is a great program. And then they'll say something on the phone to their wife, like, yeah, the program's fine. It is what it is. I got to get the time off, right? And they'll hear that and they'll think, you just said this is a great program. It's helping you overcome your drug addiction. Yet you're blowing off the program on the phone? like. You don't really want the program. You just want the time off, right? Never forget whether you've been sentenced or you've gone to prison, put yourself in the position of the stakeholders. I'm going to attend a sentencing here tomorrow in Los Angeles to support a client who has a documented history of abuse, then do a counselor, yet the U.S. attorney in the position paper is saying, this person's lying. This person doesn't have a drinking issue. This person is making this up only to get into the drug program. So think about that for a moment. 
The drug program, for example, states if you disclose drinking or alcohol use in the 12 months preceding your arrest or indictment, disclose it in the probation report, and if you're an American citizen, nonviolent crime, you get 24 months or more, you're eligible. That's the law. Yet you have the opening of a position paper from the government telling the judge this person's continuing to kid a, commit a con. This is a ruse. Th that's the stakeholders. Not all do that, but some do. And if you don't embrace that, then you're being naive and you truly are not investing the time to understand the system or you're going to default to, I'm a good person. I've never done anything wrong before. I don't even have a speeding ticket. They're going to see me for the good I do. I see you that way. We don't think you should be going to prison. But that's not how they perceive you, especially with some people who don't want to let you out of prison earlier. For these reasons, you've got to spend hours going through all of the free content our team produces, presuming you want the success at every stage of the journey. Now, as we continue, disciplinary infractions often originate by people engaging in the prison hustle. Is there anyone home from prison? Linda or Scott can give an example of what the underground economy is in federal prison. What is that? Um, my, the biggest example I can think of is there was a woman sewing pillows for 50 bucks. Okay. Um, my answer to that would be before you go in, learn to sew. Um, the stuffing was not necessarily procured you know, the way it should have been. But there, there's a huge issue, at least in the women's in, in Danbury, that they do not have pillows, they just have lumps on the mattress. So, um, and every time they do a shakedown, they don't, they don't, they don't throw you in the shoe for it. But what they'll do is they'll just throw the pillows away. So then it starts all over again. Um, that's that, that's, that would be my biggest example of something that's a real shake. That's, that's a real hustle. So something that I want you to understand, there are some things that staff may allow and not report. For example, you have to use your own judgment here because technically they're an infraction. Some people are in prison for a very long time and they don't have endless resources coming to them. So part of the way they'll sustain themselves is doing someone's laundry, their sheets, ironing their clothes for a book or two of stamps a month. And that is technically a disciplinary infraction because you're paying someone to do these things. When I was in prison, I saw that. I never saw anyone get into trouble for that because I think a case manager can recognize this person's been in prison for a while. He's working three or four jobs and this is a way for him to make money. That's fundamentally different in my experience than paying someone to do Correct. your job, right? There are people after I surrendered to prison who said for a book of stamps a month, I'll do your job. And there are people that will do that. You might not ever get caught, but think about it. <laughs> in prison, you, if you're smart, you can find a way to get a job that's 30 minutes a day if you mm -hmm. do it properly. But you don't have the time to do your job 30 minutes. And then ironically, sometimes people paid someone to do their job and that person didn't even do the job. <laughs> now, you're really, now you're really in a pickle. So we would encourage you to understand there are things that are really obvious, like an iPhone, not showing up for work, speaking back to staff. But there's also hustles that can lead to trouble like paying someone to do your job or paying someone to, to clean your sheets, finding creative ways to grow your commissary budget from 360 to $1,000 a month. And the consequences of the hustle can be really significant. I won't tell you I didn't do things. And in retrospect, it probably wasn't the best idea because it really could have derailed my plans. But as I said earlier, I figured I'd kind of understand this place. Now I've got it. That was a weakness. I was fortunate to not, to not get caught. Scott or anyone, can you share some of the prison hustles that, that you came across while you were in prison? The, the, the prison hustles in Yankton were, were unbelievable. I drastically underestimated everything from, do you want your clothes washed? Do you want your clothes ironed? Do you want to find a specific pair of shoes? Um, making cheesecakes, making peanut butter pies, cooking food, prepping food. Um, there was a sports ticket. There was Texas Hold'em. There was Omaha. It really, whatever you could think of that needs to be done, there will be someone trying to do it. And again, like Justin has said, where it gets tricky is if the staff wanted to, they they can write you a shot for that. Um, I think one of the things I noticed is is just respecting that when you're in a camp, it, it can be easy to think, I don't want to be here. This shouldn't have happened. My case was unfair. But you're around guys who who maybe have been in prison for 10 plus years. And just understanding they're trying to make a living so they can buy some food, not eat at the chow hall every day. Uh, you just have to be cognizant of, is it something that, that you're going to participate in? 
or do you want to follow the rules and avoid it? It's very helpful. So the, the reason we're, we're sharing this video, I wanted to do this video is because everyone, and then I'm gonna answer some questions here. Everyone that goes to prison has aspirations to rebuild their career. Many people wanna write a book, prove worthy of the love of their family, build a new, whatever it is. It's harder if you're in trouble. It's harder if you're in prison longer. It's harder if you're not getting, for example, this guy, this woman, this wife who called her husband's going to lose the good time, a whole year off the sentence. It's going to be hard when the family goes back to BOP.gov and sees that year going back on. I mean, that's devastating. Why? Because he, he was vulnerable and, you know, he couldn't resist temptation and he got caught and it's just more regret. We can't change the past. Can't change that you're immersed in a government investigation. Can't guarantee how well you will perform and how hard you will work in prison. Can't, can't do that. There are people who get there who say they're going to do everything in the world and they get there and it's a hopeless environment. They say they can't get started. They cannot build any momentum. It's coming. If you're going, you, you have got to recognize there are people who are going to dissuade you from preparing and taking action that will be jealous of you. Just follow your own path and avoid problems because it's harder on your family. It's harder on those that love and support you. Prove worthy of that. And don't ever make up things that you're doing or build it into your release plan if you can't document it. You've got to be able to show it. And I guess the last thing I want to say before you go to questions is, I know for me and you and my probation officer and people who are meeting with their probation officers, they are reading the release plan. Someone in our community who is at the federal prison camp in Thompson, Illinois, I wonder if they're on the webinar, shared the release plan with the case manager. And she said, you should teach a class on this. You should teach a class on this release plan. This is like really impressive, but he's getting released on Tuesday. <laughs> but the point is it's gonna help him all throughout the journey. Why don't you teach a class on how to build a best in class release plan in prison? We've given it to you. We've given you the workbook. Why don't you, why don't you teach that? Why don't you do that? It's a great way to give back and you're developing your communication skills. You're contributing. And if you ever make a mistake in prison, if you're productive and giving back, you know what happens? They tend to take it easy on you. I made some mistakes, but because I was proactive and I never complained, they kind of took it easy on me, both prisoners and staff. It's a great idea. Great takeaway from this webinar. Write your release plan, then teach a class in prison on how to build a best-in-class release plan. We've given you all the tools for free. Let me go through some of these questions here. Scott, thank you so much for responding and answering some of these questions. I'm surrendering to Otisville Satellite Camp. Can anyone offer any insight? Look, I've always said most of these camps are the same, $10 bill or two fives. Though if I had to choose a camp on the East Coast, it would be Otisville. You're very fortunate. It's a very good camp. A lot of my Jewish brothers are at that camp. So there's a heavy Orthodox Jew population. But I've heard wonderful things about uh, the camp and many people have crowned it the crown jewel on the East Coast. Uh, but it's still prison, don't forget. But it's, uh, from what I've heard, it's a very, very good camp. Someone asked about visitation at Mariana for employee, no visitation. We encourage all of you, uh, your family, remember I talked earlier in this <laughs> webinar, and a primary point of contact. It would be a good idea, we think, before you visit to go to BOP.gov and look at the prison just to make sure you get a sense of it's a level one, two, or three facility, okay? And you, it might tell you visitation is suspended. There you go. All visitation at this facility is, has been suspended until further notice. There are people who will make that trip to see their loved one at Mariana because that person's out of phone minutes or doesn't have access to email, will show up only to learn visitation has been canceled. Good idea to go to BOP.gov in advance of your surrender to, or before anyone visits you to, um, to make sure. So these things change pretty quickly, by the way. Prison visitation could be closed and just like that, it's back up. But I want all of you to spend some time at BOP.gov before you go. Someone asked, is a better camp, Cumberland or Morgantown? Both have RDAP. Cumberland is next to a medium. Morgantown is next to a standalone camp. Again, I think it's that analogy of $10 bill or two fives. There are people who think they're at the worst camp. They transfer to another camp and they're like, wow, this camp is worse. And I think the reality is they say that about every camp. There are pros and cons to each spot, I suppose. Maybe some has a little better living situation. Maybe one is a pod, one is a cubicle, one is an open dorm like Lompoc. But they're going to have similar programs. And in your case, if they have the drug program, fine. I'd prefer to go to one that's closer to your home. 
better for your family. But it, Michael was in 27 prisons throughout the years and he thrived in all of them, as will you. It doesn't matter all that much. I choose one that's best for your family and visitation if you have an opportunity to, to have the judge make that recommendation. Always do what's best for your family and do the, uh, and do the drug program, absolutely, if you're, uh, if you're eligible. Let me make sure there's any other questions I'm not asking here. You need to check if your medication is on the ones that BOP provides correct. When we send out this webinar replay in a couple of days, I will include a link to the BOP formulary. It's a good idea. And if you're working with us on the post-sentencing, you would speak with Carol um, to go through that process. Make sure I'm not... Are there any hands up, by the way, as I continue to go through any of these, these questions here? Yes, Ron, talk to me, Goose. Let me unmute. Thanks, Justin. Hey, I, I had a, a comment and a question, yes. and I saw some of them are related to the questions that they're asking in the community. Um, through the community, I befriended Jason Larry. Um, uh, Jason uh, uh, surrendered about two or three weeks ago. I noticed by by attending the, the weekly webinars and I listened to him that he I realized he was from my area. I reached out to him actually through a direct uh, uh, communication during one of these webinars. He and I became friends. The nice thing about that, and, and I'm going to suggest that other members in the community consider doing the same thing, is he he went in, he will have surrendered and be there, be at the same camp I'm going to go to about four months. And since he's been in, he and I probably talk, if, if not once a week or communicate either by phone or email or three or four times a week. But the information that he's giving me is very reassuring. It's like the questions that are being asked. What's it like? What's your average day? Do you have a job yet? What's the food like? Some of the real basic information that, that I think people are, are just dying to, to thirsty to, to, to get that information. Uh, plus, I'm helpful to him. Uh, you know, he asks questions that I could do for him on the outside that I that uh, that he can't do, or maybe he doesn't want to ask his family to do because he's already imposing on them already. So it's a great opportunity to create a community within the community, even to the extent that. Uh, uh, Jason introduced me to Michael White, who I, I see is on here today, and, and Michael and I have become friends. Michael's going to go to the same camp. He's he's from Florida, and he's going to probably go in three or four months after I do. So I'm going to be able to serve that role that uh, that uh, uh, Jason's doing for me now to Michael, and, and and I hope Michael pays it forward. But you know, when when Michael gets there, there'll be three of us again, a community within a community. We can help each other, and you know, it'll be reassuring, I think, for me, and same for Michael. That when we get there, there's somebody we can lean on, uh, somebody that can show us the ropes, help us through the process. So anyway, that's the good. I appreciate you saying that. And to Jason, right after he got in, he sent a message to us that he's off to a good start and he's writing every day. Which, it, it, which goes to my question, and, and I, I was going to touch on that. He told me that he's communicated directly both with you and Michael, and, and he he's grateful for that. Uh, uh, I think he was a little nervous of how much attention he would get once he was incarcerated. So thank you for doing that. But he had a good question. And I just thought this is my question part of raising my hand. Uh, he wanted to know, we've talked about this list and the things that you guys do for, for the members, like the books and the workbooks and, and the newsletters. And, and he was curious, what's the process of that and timing? Well, when does that happen? And, and what exactly do, do, do you guys send, for example, to Jason? So as soon as someone in our, and those every, all of our books have been sent to, to Jason. So as soon as someone surrenders, if they're in our post-sentencing program, there's five books that we'll send out. The Release Plan Workbook, Earning Freedom, uh, Prison One Day uh, that, that Michael wrote and two other books. So we immediately send out these resources. And one of the books is the Release Plan that will really guide. So now my, Jason started on the Release Plan before he went in. But we're, in fact, I think Michael's actually updating the release plan workbook this week. It will be done. So we send these resources to people within the prison. And of course, we're available through, through email, through the core link system where we're responding and offering guidance on issues that, that may or may not pop up. So that, that's what people in our post-sentencing program will receive. Well, and, well, one of the specific questions he asked about is, will he get any kind of... Uh like uh, uh, newsletters or stuff that's going yeah, oh, on. He's, yeah, he's, 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 he's getting them. So everyone in our, yeah, so everyone in our community said, so if you look at the prison professor's blog, this is a good exercise I mentioned earlier, I think that you should do this. So Michael continues to write prolifically and he's just not writing just to write. 
it's really strategic stuff that gets all of you closer to your desired goal, which is a successful journey through the criminal justice system. So there's stuff going up a lot. In fact, there are several that haven't even been added to the blog yet. But for example, Michael wrote here, every day I log into CoreLinks to update our community with what I'm learning. Sometimes I need several hours to read the number of questions. This is not always the best use of my time. There are problems in the system and a part of my job is to execute a strategy. So yes, we're getting dozens and dozens of emails from people in our community. We respond to them individually for people who are in the program, but also Michael is writing very lengthy articles on the First Step Act, what he's learning by touring and speaking in prisons across the country. What we're learning about the First Step Act and others, and of course, we're sharing that both on our blog, but also to people, everyone who's on our list in, in federal prison. All of these are getting sent out several times a week. Thank you. And, and by the way, I've gotten several several direct messages and I'll respond to them. But again, I encourage everybody to connect. We can help each other once once we transition into into the camps. Thank you. And, yeah, no, thank you for contributing as always. I appreciate it very much. Let's see any other questions here. Um, there are some. Fantastic. Someone asked about the. Oh, someone asked about Sean Hopwood, how the lawyer now is a. a, a is a bank robber. He he went to prison and he started. He it's a great case actually. He represented. He started studying law in the library. A prisoner friend of his asked him for help. Sean filed an appeal to the Supreme Court or something. And Sean actually won a case in front of the Supreme Court from prison. And then I think Seth Waxman, who is the former attorney solicitor of the United States, helped with the case and agreed to mentor. Sean and upon Sean's, he's from Nebraska originally. Upon his release, I think he got the George, he got the Bill Gates fellowship to go to University of Washington Law School and he clerked for a federal judge. Then he became a lawyer and now he works at Georgetown. I've spoken to his class at Georgetown Law School many times, so has Michael. So he's a professor at Georgetown working his way towards tenure. He's an appellate lawyer. He's represented many of our clients on the appellate oh. side. That's mind blowing. That's amazing. And yeah. But the point of how did he become a lawyer? He engineered a plan. He understood that he had a long journey ahead of him. He fell in love with the law and he needed to get people vested in his support, in, 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 believing in him. He couldn't afford to go to law school, but he was able to get a scholarship. So there are people who have felony convictions that have law degrees. Like Sean, there are people who have sex offenses who have law degrees. And I can point you to several of them. There are people who have white collar crimes who have law degrees and real estate licenses. I know I have a friend here in, in Laguna, not far from me, who served time for a white collar crime. He's a real estate agent. I could get my real estate license back if I wanted to. All I had to do is pay my restitution and get off supervised release. I was told it would never happen. I don't need it. I don't want it, but I could. So I just want you to be careful about what, if someone says this can never happen to you, well, why? There's people that it's happened to but why? And that's what I want you thinking about the engineering. I get some nice messages, but Scott has been on an email chain lately where some guy home from prison sending these weird messages. You served only a year. Why are you successful? This isn't fair. Why are you on the media? This is I served a longer time than you, angry and mad at the world. I don't even know him. But any success is in, was engineered when I met Michael in 2008. I need you to be thinking about what are you engineering? I had nothing, no job to come home to. My network was destroyed. I owed money, reputation in the toilet. I saw dudes scared to go home from prison. Like you're turning down the halfway house. Why? Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll, I need another three months in the camp to watch the track and watch the Kardashians. Oh, okay. That was going to be me. So I began to engineer this plan. And 14 years later, a lot of the time it works, but you weren't there in 08, 09, 10, and 11 when I came home, or even the struggles that Michael endured in prison or coming home, or we endure now as a company. But everything we try to do is engineered. We want you doing the same thing. That's why whether you go to Cumberland or Morgantown, it doesn't matter. If you go to Otisville or Fort Dix, who cares? It doesn't really matter in the totality of your life, which is why when someone asked me last week you know, about the fruit in the commissary, who cares? It doesn't matter. What matters is, are you avoiding problems, building a best-in-class release plan? And does that position you to get out earlier and have more liberty on home confinement or halfway house, get off probation early? 
someone in our community, Nate Schott, who contributes to a lot of these webinars, still owes restitution, got off probation 21 months into a three-year journey. Not by accident. Look at the work that he did. You can see why the judge approved it. That's what we want you doing in prison. That's what we want you doing in prison. Justin, if, if I may uh, say, yeah. the nice man in the, in the blue shirt, he says when he's going to, uh, I, I'm going to graduate from law school in May. I was a surgeon, as you remember. And um, I can tell you that uh, he says once he's in prison, he can communicate with, if they're not in the same prison, you can't talk felon to felon. That's an infraction. I believe it's a, t uh, a, a, a 100 or 200. In other words, if you're trying to communicate, if he's at one's at Otisville and say one's at uh, Coleman. Oh, yeah, I that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, that that that's, of course, you'd have to get permission to, to uh, husband and wife and they're in separate prisons can't get permission to communicate. Yeah, but there's no communications if people are in. But if someone's in prison and they have a friendship with someone, they can, they, you can communicate with them via core links, but that all ceases once that other person might go to prison. Yeah, once he's in prison, and, you know, and technically I tell people, you know, after, if you're on probation slash supervised release, it's another thing. You you, you could be around a, uh, somebody's moving your house for you, ha has a felon, your probation officer walks up and she looks up uh, the movers and say, well, you're around a felon. And these probation officers are just looking to send you back to prison, it's, majority. It's interesting. I, I'm not of the opinion they're looking to send you back. I I don't believe that. I believe they can be cynical. They can be cynical and they're used to happy talk without any follow through. In my experience, I, I don't believe they're just looking to send you back. I do believe they need to see a record. And the record that I created enabled me to have to work in this career. If someone fixes your home and they're a felon, that, that's the, we're how many? I mean, so many people in America are felons anymore. We're not even special anymore being a felon. I mean, you know how many people Correct. have records? It's not even a big. It's a. I don't feel special anymore. So it's not that. But if you go into a business with someone who is a felon and you don't disclose it, that's a problem. Which is why, in advance of my release, someone asked, "Did I meet Michael? Did you know Michael in advance? How did you progress early release while inside?" I knew of Michael Santos because my mom was reading his blog before I went in. I chose not to read it because I didn't really want to prepare. Then when I went there, I met him and he influenced me and we began engineering this plan. But moreover, I shared it with everyone, the website, a blog, a book, probation, family, network, professors, cl potential clients, whomever, everyone, everyone. I really... So that's what we want you to do. Even if you don't do it by way of a blog or a book, you still need to share with your case manager and, I, the, and your probation officer. So I agree with what you're saying about communication with felons. If you're going to go into business, a lot of the best businesses have started in prison, a felon meeting another felon and you build a business. People are working together. You just have to prepare for that and understand the obstacles ahead and properly manage your probation officer. And let me make one comment to help your the the community because I, I face this and I'm not giving a you giving this as a UPL or means unauthorized practice of law. Otherwise, I'm never going to sit for my ethics portion of it. But um, uh, you're going to everybody. In, I paid four hundred thousand dollars in lawyer fees for four lawyers total. Almost wiped me out. But none of them had the ability to understand between asset forfeiture and restitution. And uh, at 1.5 restitution, then I got peer probation. But I did end up in prison for 30 days and 30 days. That's something else to explain. But bottom line is, is this, is that those of, those of you that have not uh, uh, entered prison yet and you have an opportunity, is that your attorneys don't understand the difference between asset forfeiture. But what I can tell you is, is this. You can file a motion. It's a timeline. Everything's a timeline. They have to be. I think it's 22-day business days to get dollar for dollar for asset forfeiture towards restitution. In other words, if you sell your house for $100,000, it goes $100,000 and you pay that $100,000, it's dollar for dollar. Otherwise, like for me, my four attorneys didn't know it, $400,000 gone, 1.5 million restitution I paid off. Um, and then uh, 1.5 million, I get a note that from the asset forfeiture department. So. I'm in the middle of writing a pro se argument, at least get it somewhat done because uh, the, the, the statute of limitations is gone and uh, it's not in his jurisdiction in the district court and writing to an appeal to the circuit courts are very difficult. So what I'm, what I'm writing because um, 
there's a Supreme Court case rid of Satori called uh, Tim's versus Indiana, very important asset forfeiture. But it was meant to, asset forfeiture is meant to seize money to pay back restitution, but that's not what happened. You get double, you get a uh, double bill. And so it's, it's a sh sticker shock, but you can write to me, Lars, it, but you well, only have 22 days, money laundering asset uh, 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 recovery what, section. What, so what I would dollar like, for dollar from, from, um, from restitution to asset forfeiture. What, what I'd like to do offline, because this is these questions come up, I'd love to do a separate call with you, and maybe even a little interview and get your experience, because issues of forfeiture and restitution, these things come up a lot. And we should probably do a separate segment specifically on that. So I'll connect with you. Right, I just, uh, anybody that, right, exactly. I just want to, you know, anybody who's got like, uh, who just got sentenced and uh, are getting ready to go to prison in two or three months that they can ask their lawyer to fi file an uh, asset forfeiture. And the key is if the judge put down no interest on your restitution, 99 times out of 100, me, Lars, will grant it. You're, you're right. Correct. That's a mistake. That my lawyers didn't do. My interest was 1.66%. And it 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 was a big deal because it you're right. So I'd like to discuss that. Would you send me a message sure. just offline? We'll have another conversation about that. Sure. We're gonna thank you. I, I, it, it's really interesting stuff. It's it's important for people going going through this. Let me wrap up some additional questions here. I was told not to bring any medications whatsoever. Sorry. Uh, that's that's not what we've learned from subject matter experts we've interviewed. We've been told that you should surrender with, it could be a week or two of, of medications. You will meet with a physician or physician's assistant through the intake process. And you should absolutely spend some time on the BOP formulary list to see if you will get that same medication or what they might transition you over to. But uh, we encourage you to surrender, absolutely surrender with medications. Sometimes things that you take, they won't give you. I received an email, a text message earlier this morning that something someone in our community had had prescribed for many years, they said, buy a lower version of it in the commissary. That's the best that's going to do. So to the extent that you can understand these things before you go in, it won't be such a, a shock, especially with health related issues. Um, Justin, who is the individual that just spoke about asset forfeiture? Are you still on? Yes, Michael, Michael Rothstein, yeah, from Ocala, Florida, to Northern Florida. Michael. Yeah, we've had we've we've had communications together for many years, Michael. Yeah. I always appreciate your emails and all the nice things you've said. I'd like to. I'm gonna. I have your email. I'll connect you to you. I'd like to to break that down. You've been writing me about this for years. Yes, I'm, I'm, I got off probation. I was, I got straight probation. But just to warn the people that it's not just the um, if you got straight probation and the the, the probation officers are upset that if, if you didn't why you didn't go to prison. Well, I built a $1.5 million youth football league. I bought property and I did it for 12 years. It cost me a lot of money. So this, my crime wasn't to do with greed. It was to do with revenge or the reckoning, as I say. But uh, what I was going to also state is, is that um, uh, you're going to get fired by the banks. Justin is so good at stating this. There's so much fallout. But I, what I do recommend is, now I'm from a small town in North Florida, Ocala, it's horse country, and I do breed racehorses. But what I'm saying is that Instead of going to these big banks, you got to go to the credit union. You, you become a member of the credit union. They're proud to have you. And uh, I was very careful about, uh, again, this is not an unauthorized practice law, just what I did. And once you get to the credit unions, they're all take you felony or not because they want more members. And they treat you with great respect. Because yeah. all, all my banks fired me. They, all, they, you know, 27 years in practice, had over, over uh, $10 million dollars saved up over that and boom they fired me bank of america and wells fargo boom gone so that that's why earlier in the in the webinar we discussed having a financial plan from restitution in prison establishing banking relationships now it was about a month ago someone it was a very devastating call he was a marine for 30 years maybe 40 years since he graduated high school i think usaa fired him because of his conviction. And it's just so devastating, right? So 40 years service to our country, USAA fired him, the credit, whatever, and the, couldn't, they canceled, he had his car insurance through them as well, fired him. So there are collateral consequences that follow. So it's establishing relationships, being resilient. As Michael always said to me in prison, more to come, there's more to come, but it's how you respond to it. 
And if you respond appropriately with a plan like Michael has done, like Scott did by way of his, his website, all of you are doing it, some more than others. Regardless, it's work that has to be done. And so Michael, thank you for contributing. We'll spend more, some more time on that. Someone, I see some hands that are up. I see Joseph Parker, your hand is raised. Hi, Joseph. Hi, how are you doing? Good um, to see you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. I like the I like the I like the the ear. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was very good advice that the uh, uh, the gentleman gave. Uh, I was with USAA also. I joined the military in 1983, served till 2003. Had uh, worked my way up from enlisted to a captain in the Air Force. I had command and control of ICBMs, so I had the keys to launch nuclear weapons. I had been with USAA for. 30 years by that time, because I had, I, after I had retired and gone into medicine, I'm a medical doctor also, um, I had maintained USAA. The minute I was indicted, it seems like, they had given me a phone call and proudly stated that they had, they had um, uh, canceled the accounts of someone who had 40 years in service, because I said, I've been with you guys for 30 years. They said, well, we recently canceled a man who had 40 years. I said, that's disgusting. You're proud of that? But anyway, the NASA Federal Credit Union has been absolutely wonderful. So that's, um, I, 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 everybody else, you try to put your retirement account somewhere. It takes maybe 90 to 180 days before you get a letter saying, we're not going to do business with you. It's just, it, it's insane. It, it's punishment after punishment after punishment. Uh but, uh, Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your service. So it's thanks, that happens sir. a lot. It's ironic. I mentioned that story and, and you just shared yours because you were not the person with whom I spoke. But it, it's it's obviously it's very clear. This is part of the, the planning and why the collateral consequences of a conviction can be are much longer than time in prison. Right. And, and these are oh, things absolutely. That, and this isn't my first go around, by the way. I, I spent four years in federal prison from 2000 to 2004, came home, got my medical license back, everything going great. This whole opioid crisis thing rolled up and because of my prior conviction, I don't get the benefit of the doubt. So they rolled on everything, paid some expert to come up from Florida and say that I should have ignored all the MRIs and EMGs. It's masterful. So I would have to say, be extremely cautious when you come home. Always assume that as you say, they're going to look at you totally differently than if you had never gotten in trouble. Um, I that, didn't, I that, took ridiculous steps and it still wasn't enough, so. That, that's uh, the right advice I, I share. I mentioned to people, so early in the, the presentation, I mentioned how the government at a sentencing tomorrow opens by stating that someone shouldn't get the drug program, right? Because they think they're conning their way into it. And they, the U.S. attorney in the memorandum references years ago, a consulting firm in the Midwest got indicted and all the guys are now in prison because they conned, they guaranteed people in, entrance into the drug program. And they would tell you how to lie and what to say and how to con your way into the program. And the government references this link. And it's funny, years ago, I'm friends with the FBI agent that arrested me. He's brought me out, brought me out to the academy in Virginia to speak, and we were having a conversation. He's like, "What's it like talking to the guy that arrested you now that you're home?" I said, "You know what, Paul? Every conversation I have, I pretend I play a game like the FBI is listening. In fact, I can't guarantee the future, can't change the past, can't predict if you're going to get into RDAP, can't guarantee you're going to get out early." And he starts laughing, but that's kind of to your point because there are he kind of there are people they're watching you and they're cynical and they expect to go here he goes again so that's like a good exercise for all of you every time you're having a conversation pretend the fbi is listening you never get into trouble or say anything wrong assume you're a spy in the soviet union yeah. and don't even joke about something because i've got friends who will joke and say law enforcement friends who will talk to me on the phone and joke and say something stupid and i'm like First, I'm going to hang up on you. Then I'm going to drive up there and chat with you because you do not joke. I mean, anyway. You, always, I, you always, like even now, someone else is the government on these calls. No, no, they're not. But what are we discussing? We're talking about how to avoid problems in prison, how to develop a best-in-class reentry plan. I hope they're listening. I hope staff watches this so they can see that we're helping you 
develop a record that your family can be proud of, that we're teaching you how to avoid problems, and we're teaching you how to convince your case manager that you're worthy of more halfway house time. So is the government watching? No, I wish they were, because if they were watching, I'll, this is how I want to close. So John Gustin, whom we did a couple of interviews with, said something like, hey, there's only 7,000 halfway house beds in the country. So the case manager, they care about their job. And if they're going to make a bet on someone and give someone more halfway house, it's going to be someone they think is not going to reoffend and is going to be successful. That's the reason we've had people in our community on a 41 month sentence get 11 months in the halfway house, some get three months. Why? I can assure you it's the way that person adjusted in prison. I can point you to evidence of the guy that got 11 months. His name is Craig Carton. Google it. He's a talk show ho host in New York. He used to be on the air with Boomer Esiason, the left-handed football player. Google Craig Carton. You'll see a YouTube video I did with him before he surrendered to prison. 41-month sentence. He was home, I think, in 11 and a half months. Yes, he did RDAP, but he also got damn near a year in the halfway house. A lot of people on a 41-month sentence get three months. It's because of what he did while he was there. And, I, and he, Craig has actually spoken with some people on this call right now before they went to prison as a courtesy and said, that just do it. The end's coming, just do it. Do the reentry plan, it's coming. Write to your probation officer, you're coming home soon, it's gonna help, just do it. Even if you think it doesn't matter, just do it. That's what he'd like to say, just do it. You got kids, you got a family, just freaking do it. Please, Frank, I see your hand up. Frank, Thank you, you yeah, I, I'm, I'm there, I'm sorry, I had to unmute for- Don't be sorry, Frank. Really, really, really quick question, and that is with regard to the institutions that we might be assigned to, I still don't know my assignment yet. Um, do we have a directory of other folks in the community who might be in those institutions so that we might uh, uh, meet them or try and make connections with them? I like the word assignment you used instead of designation. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but I, I like it. I've been assigned. I'm going to use the Frank. I'm always going to give you credit for that moving forward. That's my new term. I've been Thanks assigned. So <laughs> That's my new term. That is my new term. Generally, yes. For example, Scott Laney and I spoke with someone earlier today who's going to most likely go to Morgantown. And we, we are the people there with whom we can connect in or people who are home from there. So in your case, Frank, because you might go to Atwater, you have the privilege of speaking with Michael Santos, who served time there. So you get real interaction. Of course, as someone is there, we'll be able to connect you with him. Um, generally speaking, there have been times where someone's going to a prison and we will not make the connection. I don't want to connect you to someone if unfortunately someone's really getting into trouble and not doing their job. Those things happen. I use the analogy, some people retain us. Not everyone is, wants to do the work and, and trouble follows. I'd say it's one out of a hundred, but it happens, okay? But yes, generally speaking, wherever you're gonna go, we'll be in a position to connect you with someone or you'll speak with someone who's been there. Thanks so much. And one last question is from an ongoing basis, just so we don't lose time, even if it might be a short amount of time, how do we continue to make contributions to the community while we're incarcerated? I, what we encourage people to do, and, I, and this is something that uh, we, we should do, we get a lot of great messages from core links. Ron discussed this earlier with Jason, how Jason's sending messages from the prison. It can be really cool if you're documenting your journey or learning things in the camp, and I could read them here. For example, this afternoon, I'm going to read a couple, of, I'm going to do a couple of podcasts based on some things that Michael has learned, and I'll offer my insight. So something that, that you can do or anyone can do if they want to contribute, write us and give us permission, or we can anonymize your name and just share, hey, I've been in prison for a week. This is what I'm learning. This is what I got right. This is what I got wrong. This is what you guys should have covered on the webinar. I blame you guys for this. Give us the good and bad. We can take it. So, but that's a great way for you to contribute and continue, continue to contribute to our community. We'd welcome that. And all you have to do is send us an email and give us permission to use it. All right, all right, sure. Well, and loved your uh, podcast yesterday. I'm sorry, your uh, uh, video yesterday, uh, because if I was working out six to eight hours a day and trying to look like Sylvester Stallone, they'd probably find me in the middle of the track face down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I turned 40, it, uh, I turned 48 last week and my wife and I were going through photos with her, my daughter. And I said, uh, I, still, I had all the prison muscles when we met. Now I just work all day. <laughs> and my media, uh, was, my media, that was a good one. 
and my medium t-shirt is way too big. What happened? I said, kids in a career happened. Okay. <laughs> I don't have eight hours to walk that, to run that dusty dirt track anymore. Okay. Uh, please. Thanks, thanks for lifting my heart yesterday. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a quick comment. And anybody who got, who didn't get into a prison camp and unfortunately uh, this is comical. It's comical now. It wasn't comical at the time. There's some unwritten rules. Once you guys get out, supervised release or I just got straight probation. You can go gas. You can go food shopping, especially I live by myself. Like I was doing community service. I did a thousand hours in one year, which really impressed the judge. That really impressed a thousand years, supposed to be 200 hours minimum a year. And I did 1000 in exactly one year. But on the way home for birthday cake, I stopped at, we have Publix down here and I ran into the director of the probation office. From there, they said, well, I wasn't able to call my lawyer or nothing. You go to the halfway house. I said, okay, I'll, when do I report? I'll do it. She got it set up. She says, oh, no, you got to go to Coleman first. Then you can be transferred. See, she didn't include that. So I had to do 30 days in, in the probation office, to, excuse me, at Camp Coleman, which is huge at low, and then finally get into the RRC, which is, they didn't tell me that, right? But you can't just go, even if it's, pub, it's called public law, you can't just go right into a, to a, which is right down the street from my farm to the RRC. I had to go to Camp Coleman 45 miles away. So what I was going to say is, knowing what I know now, is that I feel, and I think you've had this uh, discussion before, Justin, is that going into a low, to me, to some degree, is safer and uh, more movement than a, uh, even without the fences, than a prison camp. There's, there's well, more to do, there's more movement. And also the RRC, I mean, you know, they let me work to, to work with my horses, but, you know, um, the movement is three 45-minute breaks a day. That was it. It's funny you mention that because unfortunately, everyone here who wants to go to a low, if you're camp eligible, you're not going to a low. So <laughs> but there are some people on sure. this who are, who are going to a low. Uh, there are some, based on the crime, there are some people here who are not American citizens. So even if it's a six month sentence, they have to go to a low. And many of our clients or people in our community who are told they can go from a low to a camp, they're like, no, 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 I'm fine here in the low. More resources, more programming. It's bigger, easier to lay low. So it's interesting. We've had, uh, we had Brandon, who is at the low in Danbury, told he can go to the camp. He's like, no, I just want to finish out my sentence here. We hear that a lot. Whether you're going to a low or a camp, you're going to be fine. You're going to adjust well. Uh, but with their, their, it's interesting. Sometimes when people get designated to a low, they freak out. I thought I was going to go to one of these camps and they get to the load and they turn down going to the camp. It's funny how things can change and what they expect to happen doesn't happen as much as we may tell them. Even speaking with Michael, who was in a low for many years and a camp, it's fine. We've done those videos, low compared to a camp. There's differences, of course, but if you adjust well, it's all fine. Any other questions that we missed? I'm so grateful that everyone continues to come every week. And if anyone has insights on what you'd like us to cover, you should tell us. We we did a webinar a couple of months ago that people like where I did like uh, 10 minutes on six different subjects, federal probation for 10 minutes, life in prison for 10 minutes, preparing for sentencing for 10 minutes, between sentencing and surrender for 10 minutes, kind of like uh, how to get off probation early, how people violate on probation. So if any of you have insights on what you think we should cover in these webinars, I can assure you our team can cover it. Difference between forfeiture and restitution, we will absolutely cover that. Thank you for the question. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. We always want to do that. Yep. Can I uh, say one thing based on something you said earlier? Only if it's nice, yes. <laughs> it, it's neutral. Uh, I looked at the, uh, the visiting uh, preparations for my son's camp, which is in Leavenworth. I'm in California, a long way to go. Didn't want to go there and not be able to uh, see my son. And it said that there was no visiting allowed. And that was incorrect. Uh, so I contacted my son. I said, are they allowing visitors? He said, every, every weekend, all day, no problem. And uh, I went and it was fine. Uh, and if, I, if, if you look at the uh, website, it'll tell you that no visitors are allowed. So you need to check with the uh, person you're gonna visit at the camp and find out what's going on because accuracy in the Bureau of Prisons, if you said, many times before is don't necessarily belong in the same sentence. That's a, that's a great point. Mark, I'm gonna to come to you in one second. Let me address this. I second that question. At what point you get assigned your probation officer? 
Do we find our PO while still inside or do you just report to probation? Uh, generally in prison, your case manager will ask you for your release address. They'll give it to them. They'll assign it to a probation officer who will most likely visit your home to confirm the release address. I didn't know who my probation officer was in prison, though I knew that the district, I knew I had the address for the probation, 22041 Burbank Boulevard in Woodland Hills, the probation office. So I used to say to Michael, why am I don't even know who to send these letters to. And he would say, write it, send it to the, the head of probation in that district, make a copy with your copy card you bought in the commissary, send it. Maybe he gets it, maybe he doesn't, but then you'll have a copy. So you might not know who your probation officer is in prison. Send your letters or your release plan to the head to the probation office, make a copy. Then when I shook his hand at the halfway house in Hollywood, he um he told me he had my letters. And it was, I was surprised because I was planning to give him my book lessons from prison. And when I gave it to him, he said, as a government official, I'm not allowed to keep this book. I'm going to give it back to you. I said, when? And no joke, three years later, when I finished probation, he actually gave the book back to me. Surreal. August 16, 2012. The point is, you may or may not know your probation officer. You're going to know the address. You're going to know the probation office that will supervise you. Send them your letters, make a copy, and then bring it with you. To the question of travel law and probation, yep. I was able to travel the country more than 50 times, speaking, traveling on ethics and white-collar crime. I only had one issue traveling, believe it or not, when I went to speak at the FBI Academy. My probation officer didn't want me to go. Then the Academy, FBI stepped in and said, he's coming. That actually created a bridge with my probation officer because he felt emasculated that probation, the FBI was stepping over him. It was very uncomfortable and he made it harder on me for about three months, including taking a week to approve a travel request instead of what used to be a day. But yes, you can travel. I knew that was coming next, travel outside the New Year. I knew it was coming. There are some people in our community who have been able to leave the country, including Canada, Europe, Portugal, Venezuela, Israel. In my case, Judge Wilson did not allow me to go to Europe to speak at a KPMG conference, which was fine. I did not get permission to travel into Canada to speak at University of Toronto. I applied. It took two years for the Canadian consulate to deny me, and I didn't have the resources to hire a lawyer to try to get me in. But yes, you can travel both in and out of the country while on probation. It's easier if it's work-related. In fact, it should be work-related. I tested one time trying to, I, I don't really like football. I tested one time trying to travel to a, a Sunday night, Monday night football game in San Diego with a friend. And I tested it knowing the probation officer would deny it and he did because it wasn't work-related. So it should be work-related, but you get strategic and smart. So if I had a, a speaking event at Columbia University on a Friday in New York, I would travel on a Tuesday because I'd have a lunch meeting with a professor at NYU on Wednesday instead of just fly there on Thursday, fly home on Friday. So you get you line up meetings, it's work. When I traveled, I'd have to get a letter from the pro professor or university. When am I speaking? How much am I getting paid? Same thing with other events that I did as well. So you might need to provide some evidence of where you're going and why. Never once did my probation officer reach out to KPMG or Columbia to find out if it was true. He just approved the travel. And you want to build that into your release plan, by the way, like I did. I built in that it was a goal to travel the country to speak to universities and businesses about the consequences of committing a white collar crime. So, and it was in the book. So he wasn't surprised. When I was free a week or two, I traveled to Chicago to speak at DePaul University. Approved. A lot of dudes would tell you, you can't travel the first month on probation, first two months. It's not going to happen. Okay. My, Mark, your question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank Michael for his insights on the forfeiture restitution thing. And uh, just a quick question uh, for the gentleman who uh, said his son was in Leavenworth and he was from California. Again, that's way over the 500 mile uh, rule. Any insights on the reasoning for that why they signed him so far away from his home i've seen that happen i, I have some uh, mr carper if you want to answer why they sent scott so far away i have some insights of course i don't know if you have anything you'd like to share i, I don't think i can do a better job than you'd be able to do figuring out why the bop does anything is <laughs> is 
<laughs> is impossible. Uh, he did uh, have the uh, the requirement to the requirement the opportunity to go into RDAP, and it's possible that there are were more RDAP uh, availability in Leavenworth than there was on the West Coast. But uh, we were surprised and unhappy and. Thank God we had uh, Justin and Michael and everybody to, to give us some sense of, of things that we would face and things that we just have to, to deal with because uh, you, you don't ever get the answers that you would hope for. You just get answers. That, that was a great answer. I will add to it. And sometimes people think I'm delusional. I'm not. <laughs> but when Scott, called to, when Scott called to give me the news, I said, this is fantastic. And he's like, are you crazy? I'm like, this is fantastic. He's like, you're crazy, right? I'm like, no, you asked, your lawyers asked for Lompoc, which doesn't have the drug program. You have a very short sentence. So there's a chance you go to Lompoc, takes three months to get in. Then they could put you on Con Air or Transit to get to Sheridan. And you can be in prison six months longer because your lawyers asked for a prison that doesn't have RDAP. So I said, I know you don't wanna to go to Kansas, but I'll tell you this, it, it's gonna get you home more quickly. And then he's like, hey, I'm excited to go to Kansas. <laughs> it's crazy, it's crazy how things, but he's had a great attitude. Mr. Carper, without getting into the details, would you just briefly touch on Scott's awesome newsletter that he sends every week and, and just how you've enjoyed reading them? Well, Scott, uh started before he went into uh, yes. uh, Leavenworth and uh, told uh, a, a group of people that are uh, that he's connected to or good friends with uh, about uh, what he would be facing. And every week, uh, send it out on Mondays, uh, he has a two page newsletter indicating what he's doing, what his plans are, what he hopes for, uh, what his experiences are. And actually uh, some of the kind of questions that have come up today in terms of what uh, life in in, uh, in in prison is like, and I think you know uh, Justin and Scott Laney, you know, are reading these and probably helps them understand at least what's going on in Leavenworth and contrast it with what's going on in other places. But uh, I he loves Mondays because that's when I send out the newsletter, and he gets a lot of <laughs> core links emails back from yeah. all his friends who are reacting to what he's saying. And kind of impressed with him because he's got a, a really amazing schedule that he's got going in terms of everything he's doing there. So he's taking uh, what uh, Justin's been saying to heart, I think. Uh, Justin would be a better judge of that than I am, but uh, uh, it's it's been very well received. And we now know who his probation officer is. We found Excellent. out last week because she came to my house to visit. And so we'll be sending uh, the newsletter her and he has a name he can correspond with, uh, with her. So uh, it's, it's good. So that before I call on Christina, there's a big difference between knowing what to do and doing it. So that he's doing it, it changes the whole journey. And our team is just so grateful that we've had, we played a small role in that adjustment. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. It's just wonderful news. Uh, Christina, you're, I see your hand up. Hi, right, thank you. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, it was just back in, in reference to, um, since I'm taking notes, I might have missed it. When you said to write to the probation office locally, is that locally, for example, going to Mari Mariana um, Women's Camp Satellite, would I be going writing to that local office? Or I live in Decatur, Georgia, would I be writing to that local office? I want you to send me an, an email. We might have someone at Mariana we can connect you with who will help your adjustment, okay? Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Absolutely. So the, the answer to your question is it will be the probation office in the district that you're going to return to. So you'll, it's, it's not going to be in the probation office where you're serving time. They're going to get your release address and wherever okay. you're released to, it will be the probation office closest to that release address. Okay. So probably where I live now, I plan to return home. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I see more hands up. Let's see whose hands am I not calling on? I see, am I missing anyone's hand? I see someone gave me a thank you with a smiley face. Thank you, appreciate it. Is there any question I haven't 
Frank, is your hand back up or was that? Yep, it, it is very, very back up. Very okay. One. Uh, you had asked for some recommendations of things that at least I hadn't been part of. And that is the simple things like the best use of core links. How do we do it? How do you best communicate? Um, I saw something come up about possibly there being um, video conferencing or something like this, or maybe I'm the female, in the female prisons, not the camps. Not uh, the got it. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it, had you considered or has there been uh, uh, something put up on best use of core links and communicating while you are incarcerated? Yes and no. I will take it into under advisement and create some message for best and worst practices of core links. It's on my list. Prior, prior to my assignment. Thank you. Prior to your assignment in April. <laughs> yes, I understand. And, 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 yeah. per, and, and per you, you've given me many assignments. So now yeah. I'm getting assigned by someone else. Thank very you. Very good. I like it. Good. Very good. Rob, I see your hand up. Hmm. Unmute yourself. While Rob's working to unmute himself, uh, Disha, if I said that incorrectly, forgive me. You'll see your judgment and commitment order. So you know where you're the district in which you were sentenced. It would not be hard to ask your pretrial services officer or your lawyer, like what probation office or what's the office that's going to assign me? It's probably the same office where you might have sat for your probation interview. It was for me. I did my probation interview with a probation officer. And that was the same office that oversaw my supervised release for three years. So ask your lawyer, ask your pretrial services officer what, what probation district is going to supervise you. Yes. Um, I'm, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Um, my wife is in Mariana. Um, she's been in there for 40 days now. So um, I'd like to know how I can get her the books that you were talking about earlier. Uh, as well as I'm getting ready to be sent to uh, Allenwood in Pennsylvania. Okay. And um, can I send those books directly to her or does, she, does it go through the core links or? Negative. So when you, I'm going to put up a link, there's a whole bunch of links I got to send out to everyone. And that's going to, we'll do the webinar replay and all that stuff. But here are the books, the people in our post-sentencing program, we send these books just after their surrender. If you'd like to invest in them, the resources go to our nonprofit. I'll put a link up to this if anyone wants to, to buy books and send them to their loved ones. Again, if you're in our post-sentencing program, do not buy them, we're sending them. But let me put a link here uh, in the chat. But when I send this replay out, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to include a whole bunch of links. But that's a resource Perfect. page from prison professors to buy the Perfect. books. Perfect. So is there a way to appeal? Uh, I live in, in Savannah, Georgia. Is there a way to appeal being sent to Allenwood? I mean, that was a big shock. I love Savannah. Spent some time there many years ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, you can work for a redesignation. No guarantee that you'll be successful. But there's a path to, to try to ask the BOP to redesignate you. And that's kind of a conversation. If you wanted to discuss that with Scott offline, you're happy to do that. Some people are redesignated, some are not. It's it's not always easy, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. But that's okay. there's a, a process. But why did they designate you there, and all things of that nature? Do you have co-defendants in one prison versus another? There's myriad factors they consider. So, if specific questions, I'd encourage you to to talk with Scott. Perfect. Uh, any other questions, Frank? Yes, let's close it out. A, a real quick one on the book specifically, and as you could probably see behind me, I'm a voracious reader, and that um, understood that Amazon can send the books uh, to prison, etc. You can send books, but can your loved ones or others uh, pack up boxes of books and send them to you in prison? Yeah, they can. They can send you books. Uh, Amazon. I mean, just they can. They can send you books. I don't think they can send hardcover books. It has to be paperback. But yes, they they can send you books. Well, I'll also when we send a link out, send a link with mail, so you understand the mail policies within prison. Recently, someone sent in a visitation form to the counselor in a yellow envelope, and it was denied. It had to be a white envelope. So you want to understand these things before. Wow. Um, it's a big it's a big threat to the prison if it's yellow versus white, apparently. So these are just this is the bureaucracy you've got to manage. OK, that's why we have all these resources too to ensure that you know what you're doing. Um, 
is there a limit of how many books? I've read it's five, Matt. Yeah, you're supposed to have no more than five books in your locker. Are you going to get into big trouble if you have seven? Probably not. But once if you, you know, once you read it, send it home, donate it to the library, whatever it is. Okay. Wow, we went on for nearly two hours. Really grateful that everyone joined us. Hope you all have a wonderful, what's happening my Thursday? A lot of calls this afternoon, in case any of you were wondering, you don't seem that curious, but that's okay. So I look forward to speaking with all of you this, this afternoon. I'm gonna support a client at our, her sentencing tomorrow, and I'm gonna film a YouTube video about the sentencing. Gonna talk about what the government's asking for, how she prepared, and we'll see what's going to happen. But I'll do a YouTube video from the sentencing hearing tomorrow and post it on YouTube on Saturday. Okay, Thank everyone? You. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll be in touch with you very soon. Thank you for joining us for nearly two hours. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.